Good morning, Ohio. It's James Ernest along with Mike Goodpasture on UC Bearcats on the Prowl. Thank you for joining us this evening. Well, thanks for having me, James. But since I'm your co-host, I'm going to be here every week, so you don't have to sound shocked. <laughs> oh, no, I was thinking the audience for uh, joining us. Oh, okay. No, I expect, I expect you to be here, but no, I want, I want them to feel welcome. <laughs> I'm just messing with you, James. It's the way to start the show out. Excellent. So uh, who do you feel is going to be the most important player for UC's offense this year? Uh, this year, I think there's no doubt that running back Michael Warren is the most important player on offense. Uh, last year, of course, he was 12th in the nation with 1,329, 1,329 yards and fourth with 19 rushing touchdowns. Uh, they actually have a really strong stable of running backs also. It includes Charles McClellan, Tavion Thomas, and 2017 rushing leader Jerry Dokes. Um, Warren had, I think, seven games with 100 yards and scored a t- touchdown in 10 out of 12 games. And he will be huge, especially, I mean, you've got a quarterback here that is going to be in his second year who played really strong last year. So I think your most important player may be Michael Warren and that stable of running backs. But in the end, it's all going to come down to the offensive line where they did lose some players last year. Exactly. That's where I agree. I think that uh, the offensive, offensive line, I know it's not just one position, It's, you know, a team effort with them. But I think that is actually the bigger issue because, like you said, the running backs, you have running back by committee options or, of course, just giving Warren the ball on a consistent basis because of how great he did last year. But, I mean, getting Dokes back and having him healthy and the other running backs are are nothing to sneeze at. So, of course, I mean, that is going to be the area. And then, of course, Ritter, I mean, just how great he did last year, but you're always worried about, say, a sophomore slump or, like you said, because of the offensive line uh, changing up and also his receivers changing up a little bit as well. His uh, main receiver, Lewis, last year is no longer with the team. So, uh, you know, that's well, he's, it's not that he's no longer with the team. It's, he graduated. <laughs> yeah, he didn't go to Kentucky. He graduated, so. Exactly. So it's not, yeah, I was going to say a big difference between this and uh, your other show, uh, the uh, the Bengals show, where obviously players come and go, where with this, you know, they just move on because they have to after so long. So who do you feel is the key on defense? Well, I, I think defensively, safety James Wiggins may be the most important player on the defense. At safety, he kind of runs it on the backside. He led the team with four interceptions in 2018. Three of those were game winners, so he makes big plays in big situations. Um, I think they were the week four game against Ohio, the game against SMU, and in the military bowl where he picked off Virginia Tech quarterback Ryan Willis in the final minute to secure the win. In addition to all those interceptions, Wiggins was also third on the team with 54 questions, or 54 questions, 54 tackles. <laughs> and I, I think actually 54 questions would be if you have like an eight-year-old son, that's what you get daily. That's why I was thinking of that. But uh, And I think with the questions on the interior, see, I obviously looked ahead at my notes. But with the questions on the interior of the defensive line and secondary, I think Wiggins needs to continue to be the captain of the defense on and off the field as the leader. And the same thing here. When you look at the defense, same kind of question is up front. And we see this with a lot of teams. If you watched the Miami of Florida-Florida game last night, you saw how important an offensive line is because with Florida and Miami of Florida, those two teams would be national title contenders if they had offensive lines. And Miami's offensive line was absolutely atrocious. Florida's was bad. They just weren't atrocious, and it was the difference in the game. And when you look at this, I think the O-line and the D-line and how they improve during the season is going to be huge for UC. But starting off with UCLA and then Ohio State, couple weeks later I mean it's imperative that this team doesn't take too long to find their sea legs they need to have them by the middle of the first quarter Thursday night exactly I mean I agree with you Wiggins had a great season last year he's very important he's very vital to the team's success him along with the other uh, defensive backs I mean had uh, had a great season last year Uh, most of them being uh, sophomores last year that uh, the team you know was concerned about them. They had some doubts, but obviously they've proven they're able to perform. Then, of course, this year uh, they lost 
uh, several defensive linemen, uh, you know, to uh, graduation. So now, you know, they got a bunch of new players, but they're not completely new at least. They got, uh, you know, three of them are juniors. So they do have experience with the line. It's just the change does always concern you. Yeah, and I think that even with that change, this is a team that last year was the third youngest roster in the FBS. So they've got a lot of players returning. And even with that young team, they won 11 games last year. And I think that just really shows how imperative it is to have really good coaching no matter what level of football you have. And with Luke Fickle, UC has a guy that I don't think there's going to be any more five and six or six and five seasons because this guy knows how to recruit. He knows how to coach. And when you've got a guy like Luke Fickle, you've got a shot to win every year, I think. Exactly. I mean, there's been a world of difference in players versus, you know, 2016, 2015, you know, the level of talent, the size of the players, just the skill level. I mean, going the last couple of years, you can tell the type uh, type of players that Luke Fickle is bringing in is making a world of difference. And, of course, last year with their, you know, 11-2 and two record, and like you said about that big win in the bowl, um, so they did a lot of great things. I mean, of course, and it was partly or mostly, even though the offense got a lot of the, uh, the media, the press, it was mostly because of the defense. I mean, the defense was in the top 30 throughout the year on uh, allowing points. Yeah, and I think the biggest change between last year and this year is easy to figure out, and that's just the experience. Um, Desmond Ritter took zero snaps in 17, threw 311 passes in 2018. I think those 300, over 300 passes should make him an even better quarterback. Michael Warren had 54 carries in 17, 244 last year. And with his body and the coaching staff know what it is and how he can handle that workload, makes it easier. It tells you that he's a workhorse running back which is hard to find nowadays. There's a lot of guys out there that are athletes that are more of third down backs, and he has proved capable of handling even more going forward. And when you look at James Wiggins, who we talked about earlier, and cornerback Kobe Bryant, they were complete non-factors before last season. And then, you know, they just kind of kick it up. Wiggins with four, or four interceptions, Bryant had two, and their experience as part of last year's 11th-ranked defense it shut the, set them up as leaders on this year's team. And I think that experience is what should make the Bearcats even better in 2019. The problem is, and we'll get into it later on, uh, you know, with, is that even though they could be better, their, their record might not be better because of their schedules a lot harder this year than it was last year. Yeah, but when you look at that, I think it tells you just how the AAC has evolved because with teams like Houston, Memphis, of course, UCF, um, there are a lot of teams here that are very good. And I think this, I think that you could put the, a- the AAC up against the, a- or against the ACC this year and I think the AAC is deeper to what the ACC will be. Of course, there's no Clemson here, but according to what Miami and Florida State do, they don't. Lo- it doesn't look like there's anybody really that can challenge Clemson. I think this is a lot deeper division. And with that being said, I think you kind of got to up the ante at the start of your schedule. And the goal for UC is to turn into a UCF where people put them into conversation at the end of the year for a possible college playoff or a New Year's Bowl game. And this is an exciting schedule. I mean, if you're a Bearcats fan, how could you not get excited to go play UCLA on national television, the first game of the year on Thursday night, and then a couple weeks later you can watch your team go to Ohio State to face the Buckeyes. You can watch your team go to Houston to play Memphis. Um, This is not five or six years ago where the schedule was just pretty much crap. The thing about the schedule, and with UCF coming here, and they've got the, what, like a 16, I think it's a 16 straight AAC winning streak. They've been undefeated. Hopefully, they'll still be undefeated when they come into Cincinnati. And if they do, there's a chance they're going to be ranked somewhere around the top 10 because I think most people have them somewhere between 15 and 20 right now. So you're going to get to play UCLA with Chip Kelly, which is going to get you attention. You're going to get to play 
Ohio State at Ohio State. They're a top five team, and talent-wise, maybe better than last year. But the big thing here is you had a coaching change, and we don't know how Ryan Day will compare to Urban Meyer and how quickly he'll be settled. I think the Bearcats have a chance to make a run at that game. And if they beat UCLA and they can somehow upset Ohio State, that sets up an enormous game against UCF. You get the UCF game, and then all of a sudden you're looking at a team that's ranked in the top ten, and I know I'm getting ahead of myself, but I can dream, James. Exactly. There's nothing wrong with dreaming. Because I agree with you. There's a lot of potential. There's a lot of opportunities. It's just if they can capitalize on them. Uh, So of all those games, which do you feel is the most important game? I think it's the first one against UCLA because to be able to get the second and the third, you've got to get the first. I mean, if you lose the UCLA, the Ohio State game is still huge, but the overall ramifications are not what they would be if you beat UCLA. If you beat UCLA for the second year in a row, people are going to take notice. And I know that I did a college football or yeah, a college football preview show with Randy Cross, the ex-UCLA player, and he talked about UCLA a lot. But the thing that stood out to him was how tough the UC Bearcats are. And he talked about the same thing, how he thinks UC has a legitimate chance to beat Ohio State. And if they could get a couple wins there, they win two out of those three, you got a shot at a New Year's Bowl game. You win all three, you may have a shot at something even bigger, which sounds crazy. But if UCF was to run the table and just lose the UC, UCLA makes a run in a Pac-12 and goes 8-3, and three and Ohio State wins the Big Ten, it'd be hard to keep UC out then because UC also, you go to Houston. The game that worries me the most is after UCF, they go to Houston, and that's the old letdown game. You know, the Bengals, the one time out of ten where they beat the Steelers, you know, the next week they usually lay an egg. So the thing is, and Houston is a very good football team. Um, They've got a quarterback – what the heck was his name? I can't remember. It was, I think it was De'Eric King, and he is the real deal. And if that's the other thing. I think it's possible that Houston could be a top 25 team before all said and done also. So there's a schedule here strong enough that UC could really make some noise this year. So it sounds like UC has definitely got a tough schedule ahead of them. And like you mentioned, starting with the most important game is the next game. Uh, of course, that's, I think, the coach in you, you know, focusing on just the next game. But the UCLA game, I mean, last year they won, what, 26-17. They, I mean, they pretty much dominated after the first quarter. Obviously, when they came out in the first quarter, it was a little rocky because, I mean, they were they were trailing, gosh, uh, 10 points uh, early on. And then they kicked it uh, turned it around as soon as they got uh, Hayden Moore out of there and they put Ritter in. Do you feel – that, I mean, you know, it should be a challenge for UC this year at, at home. I mean, they they should do so much better, like you said, with the seven uh, experienced offensive players, seven ex- experienced defensive players, and uh, our starters uh, returning. What do you uh, think? I, I think this. I think this is a tougher game because uh, what you had last year, I think it was Chip Kelly's first or second game with UCLA. They're still trying to get their legs a little bit. And this is a very talented team. They're led by running back Joshua Kelly, who cranked out like 1,200 yards last year, 12 touchdowns. They got Martel Irby, who was a great, nice second option to him. Um, they, They are really similar to UC when you look at the running backs because they've also got Kamir Allen, who averaged well over six yards yesterday or yesterday, last year. And overall, running backs should be the offense's biggest strength. Now, they kind of mirror UC, only it's probably even worse with UCLA because if you look at UCLA, what's been UCLA's biggest problem over the last several years, that would be the front five. And they've had decent talents. They had guys like Colt Miller that got drafted into the NFL in the first round, which was a huge reach. And I think that, you know, the it's being regretted by the team that did it. And they're just not nearly good enough. And they struggled at keeping defenses out of the backfield last year. And it didn't do enough for the ground game on a consistent basis. Now, they were a better run-blocking team than pass-blocking team last year. But when you look at this, 
I, there's some holes here that I think UC can really take advantage of. I mean, the question for UCLA, is Dorian Thompson Robinson really the guy? He's a talented quarterback recruit, got his feet right a, wet right away, but it was a rocky year before missing you know, time through most of the second half of the season. I think it was Chase Griffith that came in, and he's an interesting option. Um, they lost their top target for the quarterbacks, tight end Caleb Wilson, who was gone. He was – mystery relevant NFL draft, maybe that'll tell you something. If you're at UCLA and your top receiving threat ends up being Mr. Irrelevant in the NFL draft, that's a problem to begin with. Um, because UCLA, you're supposed to have skill position players. And if you remember when they had Brett Hundley, who was a very good college quarterback, got drafted by the Green Bay Packers, they were still like a 500 team his senior year because – they just didn't have the guys up front on offense. So on offense, I think the teams are very similar. I think UC has a huge advantage, though, at quarterback. Exactly. I think, I mean, people are talking like Ritter could do some really amazing things and possibly, because he mentioned we like to dream, uh, be in the running maybe for a Heisman Trophy or, you know, other major awards. Well, I think that's more probable that he would be in the running for that two years from now for next year, just for because years, yeah. he plays at Cincinnati so what's going to happen is even if they get a, unless he just if he goes out of his mind against UCLA and Ohio State you never know but I think being at UC would hurt him but maybe two years from now it doesn't because maybe UC makes one of those UCF runs and all of a sudden finds himself ranked 15 at the start of next year and then people will talk about him because it's more expected Okay, makes sense. So with the game, it's going to be this Thursday, 7 o'clock, of course, at Nippert Stadium. And then uh, I was doing some research before the game. They have tickets starting as low as $34, but as high as 300 I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm excited about the game. Yeah. What, do you I, get to sit on Luke high. Fickle's knee while he calls the plays? <laughs> That's what I was thinking. I was like, what could possibly make that game, you know, worth that? I mean, I would you you know what makes it worth that? The fact that Nippert only seats like 40,000 people, too. Okay, that makes sense. Because in the because, past, uh, they would have thrown what? this at Paul Brown Stadium, but they didn't for a reason, I would think. Exactly. Yeah, because that was weird last year. Uh, they've got a new uh, pattern of rotating with Miami, where it's at Paul Brown Stadium, then it's going to be at UC this year, then it's going to be at Miami next year, and then back to Paul Brown. So it's kind of interesting that they chose the Miami game to be the neutral site where this UCLA game, I agree with you, uh, has potential to be a huge draw. But obviously it couldn't be a Paul Brown uh, this year because they have a preseason game that night, which never makes any sense to me because there's a lot of times the last couple of years where the last preseason game for the Bengals and the UC uh, football game starting on a Thursday are the same night. And you would think one of them would say, hey, maybe we should stop doing this, putting two uh, big-time football games in a city. Oh, come on, James. On Don't you game. call a Bengal preseason game a big-time football game? Eh, it's a fourth preseason game. I think this. I think UC should never play at Paul Brown Stadium. Why would you want to? You give away some of your home field advantage because field advantage. you're going to put yeah, 35,000, 40,000 people in Nippert. It's going to be packed. You know, everybody wear, be wearing what? They got a blackout in this game, red out, white out, whatever. I mean, the mm-hmm. players are on campus. They're going to be pumped up. They walk, you know, from wherever they walk from to the field. I mean, this is what you live for as a football player. I mean, it'd be great to play at Paul Brown Stadium. But I can also tell you this. UC UCLA would draw a much bigger crowd than the Bengals Colts preseason game or whoever the Bengals play. I assume it's the Colts because they usually play in the last preseason game of the year. You're right. Yeah, I was going to say it's usually the Colts. It feels like it's the Jets or Giants. I want to say the Giants for some reason. But you're right. I uh, Usually it is the Colts. Now, the Miami game, though, is kind of interesting because having them, uh, that rotation, what do you think about that? Because, I mean, I, I didn't care for it that season when, of course, uh, Nippert was getting repaired and they had to do every game down there because it did kind of take away from that home field advantage, that feel to it. But what do you think about uh, every third year doing, you know, that home uh, home or uh, neutral site? I think it's all right. I mean, I would just, 
I loved the Miami campus, and I went to a Miami game against Ohio last year, but there's real no atmosphere there. But I guarantee you there will be when UC plays there. And for UC, I, I think this program is building into something possibly special, maybe even bigger than what a UCF has, because I think Luke Fickle is here for a while. And if he is, this program could get big, and the AAC – I think it become a conference that maybe at some point people start thinking about, you know, instead of the big five conferences, maybe the big six. Exactly. So, in other words, the hats and the shirts that the uh, the referees were wearing the last couple of years down at the stadium, you know, the big six conference uh, might not be too uh, big of a stretch because, you know, at the time when I first saw that, I, you know, kind of chuckled that they kept referring to themselves as the big six. But uh, you're right. I mean, with the potential and, like you said, the depth that the teams have there or the league has, there is an argument that uh, it really truly does deserve to be a big six. Yeah, and when you look at this conference this year, I mean, De'Eric King, I think it's the real deal at Houston. I think Houston's a threat. Um, UCF is always a threat. Memphis has been solid the last couple of years, and they've got a good fan base. Cincinnati and – you know, I think there's a lot more question marks than there was last year. I think UCF has probably still got to kind of be the favorite coming into it, but it would not surprise me if UC wins this. I think UC beats UC, UCF at UCF, and when you look at this, I don't see why this cannot be a big-time conference. I mean, Memphis, Houston, these are big universities. And I'll, exactly. I'll tell you, I'll give you a team to watch out for, in the AAC West is Tulane. I think Tulane's going to be a lot better. And the key to Tulane is when we talk about the weakness of UC and UCLA, we talk about up front. But Tulane's defensive line, I think, is the best in the league. They, they anchor a defense that held teams to 27 points a game last fall, which back in the day that would be considered a lot. But nowadays, I mean, most college games are in the 30s, aren't they? And I think the Green exactly. Wave could be a sleeper to challenge Houston and Memphis atop the West. And when you look at this conference, I mean, Temple has been a solid program over the last few years, and they look like they're going to be solid again. Um, East exactly. Carolina ended up beating UC last year, yeah. Yeah, and East Carolina made one of the offseason's top coaching moves, I think, by hiring Mike Houston away from James Madison. The Pirates have a promising quarterback in Holton Eilers. Um, their defense has to improve because they gave up almost 40 points a game last year, and you're not going to win a whole lot giving up 40 points a game. So, you know, SMU just missed a bowl game last year in Sonny Dykes' first year. Sonny Dykes has a resume that's pretty solid. And the other thing about SMU is to get Texas transfer Sean Bouchel at quarterback. Um, Navy, they were a little rough over the last 20 games, but they, they've got a really good football coach. I don't think they'll stay down forever. So when you look at this here, to me, you've got four really solid programs right now. Um, if South Florida could come how, somehow step it up, I mean, you've got five or six programs here that are legit. And I think when you look at the East, I think Cincinnati's first, UCF second, and then I would say South Florida and Temple. In the West, I would probably go Houston, Memphis, Tulane, SMU. So I, I really think when you look at this, you've got the possibility of maybe seven or eight teams making bowl games. Wow. Yeah, I mean, that's a huge, uh, huge goal, a huge – uh, statement for the a uh, the AAC. Yeah, I agree with you. That would be a uh, game changer. So before we let you go, so what is our uh, what's our score? What have we predicted in the UCLA game uh, for this Thursday? Hmm. You gonna do that to me? I usually am the host of the shows, and I usually make everybody else pick the score. Um, I think this. I think UCLA's. Offense is going to have a hard time moving the ball. I think they have issues at quarterback. I think they have issues on the offensive line. Um, I know UC, we talked about issues on the D line, but I think with the backside being able to shut down the passing game, 
I, I think UCLA throws three or four interceptions. I think that UC is able to score some points here. I, I think that well, one of our sponsors is betnow.eu, and I wanted to bring them up because you can go there now and bet on this game. UC's a three-point favorite, and I think it's really good value because I think UC is the better team here. I don't buy into the Chip Kelly hype. So if you go to betnow.eu right now and you open up an account, you can go through to gruelingproof.com, click on the banner at the top of the page, or just go to betnow.eu and use the promo code TRUTH50. You get a 50% cash back bonus on your first deposit up to $1,000. And you have to open the account. I think it's got to be at least for $45 or $50. So if I was going to do that, I would go. I would take UC. I'd give the three points. I think UC wins this game 34 to 17, and they open some eyes. I agree with you. I mean, 100%. I definitely agree that, you know, that is a great opportunity. So you said you get um, 50% bonus? Yeah, is so, that- like, if you go there, James, and you put $50 in, you get 75 bucks. If you put $1,000 in, you get $1,500. But we all know me and you don't have $1,000, but we might have 50 that's true. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, that would be awesome to have $1,000 lying around for that. But, uh, yeah, definitely uh, $50 putting that down on, I mean, uh, pretty much it feels like a sure thing. You see, Nothing's a sure week. thing when you bet, James, just so you know. But That is true. Good point. Yeah, I was going to say we're not uh, encouraging people to, uh, you know, that we're not give, giving out guaranteed winners. But I do agree that I think UCLA is going to lose to UC. And by a couple touchdowns. So I agree. I'm saying probably more 28, 28-10, somewhere in there. A little bit less offense. But either way, you know, 34-17 sounds right as well. And then, of course, I mean, just, yeah, they, it should be a great game. It's going to be at 7 o'clock this Thursday at Nippert Stadium course they're going to have live bands there ahead of time they're going to have a lot of fun stuff they have a really cool tailgate area they do a great job there at uc and they make it a lot of fun for the fans yeah nippard stadium is an awesome stadium i've always loved going to nippard i remember the first time i went there was i think it was like princeton played moeller in a playoff game back in the 80s might even been the early 90s but I, I love old stadiums and arenas. I even love the old Cincinnati Gardens. Go watch the old, what was it, the Cincinnati Cyclones or the Cincinnati Commandos yeah. and go watch them play there. And Nippert, I haven't been there since they've upgraded it. So hopefully UC will go ahead and give me credentials for this game, UC, which James will be there taking pictures. But they need me to. Right. Oh, definitely. We agree. Yeah. You you're quite vital uh, part of the team and being able to. Uh, I'm know, not a vital part of UC, it. though. They don't even know who I am. Yeah, they, they'll learn. They'll learn. And then, of course, for the fans that don't live around the area, they can watch it on ESPN. Obviously, if you do live in the area, go down to the game. Don't watch the uh, the NFL preseason game. Go down and watch the major. Yeah, nobody cares. Football. It's all going to be four stringers in the Bengals game, anyways. Well, I was going to say, as a person who used to play on the fourth or fifth string, that's why I do love uh, NFL preseason football. I know hey, it sounds James. Insane, let's get this straight I... for the listeners. He wouldn't four string on an NFL team, though. That was third grade football. Oh gosh, no! I was four <laughs> string on a high school team, but uh, at, at Dixie High School. But still, you know, I always root for the underdogs, and it's always just nice to see them get out and play. Uh, for example, I mean, shoot, our former quarterback, I got to see him play a couple times for the Col- or once for the Colts, and it was just so cool seeing him out there on the NFL field doing what he does, you know. Yep. Um, and we're going to tell everybody, we're going to be here every Sunday night at 1030 live on thegruelingtruth.com. You can also get us live on Spreaker. And you can find this podcast basically on any medium, whether it's iHeartRadio, Spotify, Stitcher, we're on CastBox now. We just got picked up by Google Google Podcast. So you search The Grilling Truth, you can find us. And maybe we'll get a few guests on here that used to play for UC over the next few weeks. And I think this is going to be a great season, James. It's going to be a lot of fun. And 
maybe it'll end in the college playoffs. You never know. You never know. Sounds good. I'll uh, make some calls, and we'll get some uh, former Bearcats on the show. Sounds like a plan. All right, James. You want to go ahead and wrap it up for us, or you want me to do it? Okay. Oh, uh, I was letting you do it, sir. Oh, you're letting me do it. All right, guys. Um, I want to remind you, you're going to hear Survive in Advance tomorrow at 1 o'clock Eastern Time, and it should be fun because my co-host, Steve Risley, is a huge Colts fan, and we're going to break down the AFC South tomorrow, which is going to be a lot funner with Andrew Luck not there. Um, also, tomorrow night at 11 o'clock, you get Inside Boxing Daily with myself and Jeremiah Pricer. You can hear that live also. So make sure you check out all of those shows. And next Sunday night, James, if you want in on this, you're more than welcome also. But Sunday evening, it looks like Sunday evening now. It'll either be Sunday or Monday. We're going to have our first ever Grilling Truth Fantasy Football League, which I know Steve Risley, former IU basketball player, Anthony Servino from the FF Faceoff Show. Um, we're going to try to get Matt Andruscavage and Dexter Carter from the 49ers Weekly Show. And hopefully James Ernest from Bearcats From Weekly. this street house, uh, the show that's all about the house on ESPN Radio, 1530. I mean, you really going to plug an ESPN show on our show? Yeah. yeah. Okay, go it. ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, shoot, you said from, you know. So, of course, I'm uh, always from the grueling truth as well, and we do love being a part of that. But I also do have my show on ESPN Radio, 1530 in Cincinnati and 1460 in Columbus. What time and day and is that on live? Or what time and day is that Saturday, on? Saturday at 9 in Cincinnati and Saturday at 7 in the morning in uh, Columbus. And the neat thing about the show, it's a little bit different. It's uh, not just about sports, but it's a little bit about everything. Okay. So it's about everything. That's kind of like the old yep. Seinfeld where they had a show about nothing. You've got a show about everything. Exactly. All right. Oh, definitely. I mean, yeah, we got all kinds of things, remodeling and sports. And uh, we're supposed to be having a, a Godsmacks drummer on in, next week or the week after. So we got just a weird mix. I mean, it's supposed to be a show that's all about the house and supposed to be about repairing and replacing and that kind of thing. Well, if it but helps, we it I could be on the show because I replaced a door today in my house. Ooh, nice. Actually, yeah, we could uh, we could have you on, uh, you know, as hey, part of our sports um, segment. Just to let you know, everything it's a little crooked, but it's all right because it still closes, so I'm good with it. That works. <laughs> Sounds great, Coach. All right, guys, we're gonna wrap it up. Remember, you can hear all of our shows on iHeartRadio, iTunes, TuneIn, Spreaker, Stitcher, Spotify, Castbox, Google Podcast, wherever you find sports podcasts. You'll find the grueling truth. So for James Ernest, I'm Mike Goodpastor. You've been listening to the grueling truth where the legends speak.